Hi guys. Hey Kat. How are you going? Yeah, good. How are you? Good, good. Oh, do I need my background again? No, no, no. You're good with that one. Honestly. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I've been jumping from meetings today. I'm like, oh, no. I, I need to get one like that too. I just use it because, you know, it hides everything that's going to aimed at international students. Um, it is a multi-strand program, and I'm essentially the operations manager for three of those strands. Uh, so that's English Help, which is a one-to-one -one student consultation service. The English Language Enhancement course or ELIC, it's a suite of undergraduate full credit bearing language and communication courses. And they're situated in each of Griffith's four academic groups. Uh, there's the Postgraduate English Language Enhancement Program or PELE. Uh, and these are academic language and skills tutorials attached to specific postgraduate courses. Um, outside of the Gellis, I'm a convener for a postgraduate course aimed at international students uh, international communication for IT professionals. Um, I guess uh, Gellis, the, um, the earliest strand of Gellis is, is uh, English Help, uh, which was first started in 2007. And the latest strand to be added is uh, Pele, uh, which was piloted, or it was a two-year pilot in 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very large program, just to kind of give you the, the breadth of the program. I jotted down some numbers the other day. So in 2019, these are pre-COVID numbers. Uh, obviously, it's diminished this year a little bit. But um, in 2019, these uh, three programs collectively delivered uh, 100 hours of lectures, 2,000 hours of tutorials, 90 hours of workshops, and over 5,000 hours of student consultations. Um, and that doesn't include the other three strands of Gellis. So it, is, it is a very large program. Uh, it's a multi-award winning program including uh, an Australian OLT award for programs in enhanced learning. That was in 2014. I think overall it has is, it is, it is had a massive impact on the international student cohort at Griffith. Um, a very positive in fact, uh, you know, impact. We, you know, consistently positive results in internal student satisfaction surveys as well as external international surveys. Uh, improved overall GPAs for students who've engaged with the courses. Uh, and particularly with those who entered university with lower proficiency score test, um, test scores. Um, it's had, so we're reaching the students who need us most. Um, and interestingly, we've had, um, uh, since the implementation of the program, we've seen a uh, lower number of instances of academic integrity issues with internationals. So we've had a real positive impact there as well. That's fantastic. And the scale of the program is, is of note too. And uh, I think also the, um, the level of integration, obviously, across the university and with yeah. the units of study too. Yeah. yeah. Now, I also need to, we also need to acknowledge Pamela, who was instrumental in the implementation and the inauguration of almost, in fact, I think all of the programs in, in Gellis. Um, so I worked uh, underneath, under Pamela when she was here at Griffith. And so, mm. yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, John. Uh, so now we'll move on to Lucas. So Lucas, would you be able to give us an overview of um, the size and shape of the post entry support that you work in? Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, everyone. Um, so just a, a small, um, a slight uh, amendment. Uh, I we worked at Monash at Ingle, sorry, at Monash University, not Monash College. Uh, ah, yes. That's okay. Uh, so um, I'm going to talk uh, about uh, the work that I did at English Connect uh, last uh, year, uh, which is the central unit that offers post-entry um, English language uh, support to students. But I'm specifically talking about one particular approach that we trialed last year, which was embedding um, academic English and writing as part of the curriculum uh, in the master space. Um, and that was for us uh, something that uh, we've wanted to do for some time. Uh, and uh, that was an interesting experience to go through. So we worked uh, with the master of biomedical and health sciences. Um, and uh, we were approached by uh, the coordinator of that master, um, and he um, 
came for, to us asking how we could better support the students' um, academic English and writing skills in that program. And what we proposed to him was uh, that based with uh, the literature, the best model would be for one of embedding those skills into the curriculum. And he bought that idea. So that was what we were so excited about. And we were then part of the unit. So there was this unit called research training, critical thinking and communication skills. Uh, that uh, is a credit bearing unit that is um, all students are enrolled in their first semester. And as part of that unit, uh, we delivered a weekly uh, three hour uh, workshop that focused on aspects of academic writing and English. And so we had. They were, sorry, sorry to interrupt. They were like adjunct tutorials, were they? They, they were actually the tutorials of the unit because they're oh, all. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, in that case, because he built that particular unit to be uh, the space in which students would be induced to what research uh, is like in the fields of biomedical science. And then we joined the same workshop uh, to deliver uh, academic English. So instead of creating an adjunct one. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, and we uh, then had the chance to work very closely with the uh, academic. So, uh, and he would do all the uh, induction to what it means to uh, produce and uh, consume science in biomedical sciences. And then we would come uh, and highlight uh, and work with the students on the linguistic aspects of uh, communicating and reading uh, science so that they could uh, produce a number uh, of uh, texts in that unit and into the, uh, their degree. We, at the same unit, we also had uh, the work of learning skills advisors from the library. So that was the third component of the collaboration that uh, they came also to uh, work with the students, um, the skills they needed uh, in scientific research. What we did then uh, was in addition to the workshops that we delivered for students, and at that point we had, it's a, we were able to do that because it was very small cohort. So we had 45 students uh, and we did, that for a whole semester and we would provide fortnightly feedback uh, on students writing uh, as part of the unit. So they had to write uh, a number of um, reviews and a number of uh, uh, summaries and uh, things that they had to hand in as part of the assessment of the unit. And the same text they had to produce for the unit, we would use to give them feedback based on the linguistic resources that we were exploring um, each week. Mm, okay, fantastic. Thanks, Lucas. No, I, I, th yeah, we'll come back to you though, absolutely. We'd like to hear more. Um, so great. Uh, now, Ros, can I ask you, so just for a general overview of what you do in the post-entry space, what's the size and the shape of it? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, so I'm also coming from English Connect um, at uh, Monash University. Um, I'm currently the acting manager of this unit. Um, we were established in 2015 and we operate across the four Monash campuses in Melbourne and we also operate in Suzhou in China. Um, so we've got three main portfolios that, that we work in and they're all post-entry English language support. Our first one is conversational and global English. This one focuses a lot on speaking and listening. It looks at the transition to Monash and to Australia for those students coming to Melbourne. And it looks um, at intercultural communication. Then we've got our academic English portfolio. This one looks a lot at writing and grammar. And it also has a lot of uh, live classes and asynchronous resources. And then finally, we've got our online and professional English portfolio. This one builds specific resources for faculties. They are all online and it provides language screening tests. Mm. To give you a bit of an idea of the size, 
In 2019, we had um, a, a, about 11,000 um, students participating in one or more of our programs. A lot of these participation rates in 2019 were face-to-face. -face. Um, obviously, in 2020, we, we've gone all online. We've actually seen an increase in some of our participation. What we've done is that we've built a, a very large suite of asynchronous resources. And we've been working a lot with the faculties this year. So a lot of this participation um, looks quite different in 2020. And a lot of it is working really differently online, which has been interesting for us. Um, in terms of outcomes, we see in students um, a big increase in terms of their retention at the university. We see um, an increase in unit completion in their weighted average marks. And interestingly, the um, increase in weighted average marks is for regular attendees of our programs. So if you come just once or twice, you don't seem to see much of a difference, but if you come three or four, um, we also see an increase in belonging, in students' well-being, and also their willingness to engage in other services at the university. Mm. Um, finally, we, we've won one of the um, PI International Awards. And also, um, Monash has gone from rank 30 to rank 9 in the Student Engagement Survey. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Language support satisfaction. So, Fantastic. that is us. Thanks, Roz, and some very impressive figures there too. <laughs> That's great. I love the way that you've measured it in those terms too. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so now we'll go to Josh. So Josh, can you give us a general overview of the size and shape of the post-entry work you do? Definitely can. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm working on the Speak and Connect program, and this is a series of six weekly peer-facilitated conversational workshops, and they were designed specifically for first and second year international students at the University of Sydney. Um, the program supports students' transition and acculturation to a new academic environment and social environment. Uh, does this by enhancing their English language skills, building confidence, communicating in different contexts at university, and thereby supporting a sense of belonging and connectedness to the university. And the program uses a peer facilitated learning approach. And this has been shown to foster connectedness, build confidence, um, as well as lead to improved academic performance. And this year we won the English Australia Award for Innovation for the Speaking Connect program. On this program, I mentioned all operational aspects of CET's post-entry peer-to-peer programs, and that includes um, planning, scheduling of our programs, recruitment of, both, of student participants, peer facilitators, as well as the program logistics, software, promotions, and many other elements involved in the daily operations of running programs like these. So we started delivering Speaking Connect in 2018 to a pilot cohort of approximately 300 students back then. And that rapidly expanded the year after to deliver the program um, each semester to, we're targeting around 600 international students now each semester. So since its inception, our suite of post-entry support offerings has grown as well. And it now includes a dedicated higher degree by research stream of Speaking Connect, um, Speak Up, which is a program of online conversational workshops and Get It Right, which is a safe space for students to practice and develop their academic writing skills. Fantastic, thank you, Josh. And we should also call out um, to uh, the Monash team uh, because they were really generous in sharing their insights, um, what they, that they'd learnt through the Let's Chat program and that informed the design of Speaking Connect too. So yeah, thank you guys for sharing. <laughs> um, all right, so now we're on to the next question. Um, and maybe I'll just ask everyone to be um, slightly brief here so we can make sure we've got time for questions three and four and a bit more discussion. Um, so what's working well and why? So uh, John, what's working well and why? Uh, John, you're on mute. Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> I said all my important stuff already. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think at Griffith, uh, English Help, uh, which is our consultation service, uh, it's, um, it's like crack for students. They can't get enough. Um, you know, we, we probably could not put on enough. We're, all, we're almost constantly booked out. Um, it's, I'll talk a little bit more about the challenges in that in, the, in, in, in an upcoming question, I think. Um, 
I think also one of our more enduring successes has been the ELIC program, the undergraduate full credit bearing courses. Um, these are compulsory. Um, and so even though a lot of the students do appreciate the extra focus and time that they need to um, devote to building their language skills and academic language skills, it's a compulsory course for students who think their English study is over. So there is a little bit of uh, pushback and even some resentment from students that they have to take the course. Um, but invariably by the end of the course, uh, the satisfaction result, um, the student satisfaction surveys always show that the students realize the importance of the course, appreciate that they've taken the course. Um, and again and again, that's what we find with the students. So I'd say those are probably two of our most enduring successes at Gillis. Mm, it's fantastic to hear how you can turn them around from being a bit disgruntled and resistant to actually really seeing the value of them. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so now we'll go to Lucas. What's working well and why? I think the two main points of what work well uh, in this collaboration is the fact that we get to um, work with the students uh, on the linguistic aspects of the writing that is closely related to the content that they are studying. So that's one of the highlights of that. They can see exactly through the examples and the activities that we do, uh, the relevance to their own degree and to the kinds of uh, writing and topics that they are covering. And uh, I think a second thing that worked very well was uh, the collaboration with the academic who was willing to uh, have us as part of the a weekly workshop and be able to approach uh, the support that we're providing from a very uh, developmental perspective, not a deficit perspective. And so students embrace that as an opportunity for them to, uh, if they were ready, great with their uh, academic English and writing, they saw that as an opportunity to go even beyond than that. So that was something very positive as well. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Roz, how about you? What worked well or works well and why? Yeah, so um, Marta has asked if I could talk a little bit about the facilitator training. So I thought I would share three principles that I use when I'm training facilitators in our programs um, that we think work well. And for us, our facilitators are one of the keys because the students come back um, again and again because they build those connections with our peer facilitators. So um, the first principle that I use is that I start with recruitment and I think carefully about what is it that I need as an inherent skill and what is it that I think I can teach. So for example, I look uh, very much for how well students can connect with, others, with other students um, and I can teach them a lot about English later. That, that, that's um, not so much a problem. Um, and then what, why this helps me is it helps me focus on the skills that I'm going to really need um, to communicate to students in the training so that it's really clear what I think they've already got and what they can already do and then what I want them to develop. And so they can really see what I need them to have um, finished by the end of training. The second principle I use is that I put really practical activities in the training and I try to make it as close to the real experience of working in the program that you possibly can get. Um, this is because I am working obviously with students who are peers, so they know the student experience very well, but a lot of them have not had an experience of the program they're going to teach into. So because all of the peer programs are different and they have to be tailored to, situ like to the specific situations, I find that students are unlikely to see the programs beforehand. So giving them a lot of practical experience in the training really grounds them and then you find that you don't have to micromanage and you don't come back later with students who have got lots of questions or are unsure about what they are actually doing in their program. And then my, my third principle is I build layers into my team and into my training. So we have senior team members and we actually formalize this. They get a promotion and they get paid more and they get a different position description. Um, and what I, I do is this creates layers of mentoring and it actually means a lot less work for me as a coordinator. 
the students love the ability to have a leadership role. And then the second thing that I do is I layer my training throughout the semester. So um, I will have regular team meetings and I will spend a lot of time with the peer leaders, getting them to share problems with each other and solve them with each other. And this helps to give them the ownership over their problems and actually show that they work out a lot of things themselves and then they get to set goals in, in their team. And this means that there's not pressure on any one part of semester to have to get everything right. And you've also got layers of leadership and layers of mentoring through your team. So mm -hmm. those are the three principles that I use when I'm, when I'm doing training to set up um, large programs that have um, a really good ability to last for a long time. Mm. And and in talking about the peer facilitators, you you sort of um, raise a really interesting point too that these programs that we deliver, obviously if they're peer facilitated, um, it really is about the benefit to the student participants, but then also massive amount of benefit to the peer facilitators who are also students who are learning a sort of another skill set in a sense, the facilitation, the professional skills, etc. Yeah. Thanks, Roz. Uh, and so now to Josh. Um, Josh, now I've yeah. forgotten the question that I'm asking. Oh, what, what works well and why? <laughs> I'd like to pick quite a few things went well, but uh, one thing <laughs> I'd like to really point out were the spin-off programs we started offering. So Speak Up and Get It Right, which were a really big success in their first iteration back in July, August this year. Um, so these programs really honed in on a specific English language skill. Many students felt they could use more support in, so uh, was speaking and academic writing. Mm -hmm. um, we ran these programs over the university semester break, which is traditionally still a time where there's very few activities um, and support offerings being delivered to students across the university. And that actually turned out to be a real opportunity for us, uh, mainly because of three reasons. So students were very happy to have a chance to still engage with each other and start preparing for the upcoming semester. Um, the students that were attending these sessions were both students who had already completed either one or two semesters and were directed to the support either via the faculty or maybe self-identified a need for further development or extra support. Um, but we also started to get students who were getting ready for their first semester. And especially at the moment with students studying online and from home and um, there's no longer this need to wait to get to campus and start your studies students really just want to start preparing and start studying as soon as they completed their enrollment really so these support programs are just a perfect little taster for this specific cohort of what was waiting for them as soon as they started their program at university um, secondly students in the previous speaking connect program identified they often wanted to continue in a similar program after six weeks and we've even seen quite a few students uh, participating in the program twice and repeating the program twice over, as it really just offers a safe space for them to um, develop their English language skills. And these new programs are a perfect place to direct these students to, to continue learning and to continue being engaged with this offering and continue the journey of Speak and Connect. And then finally, it also worked in reverse um, and the program brought us a pool of interested, keen and engaged students to recruit for the next iteration of Speaking Connect. So together, the three programs really created a virtuous cycle um, with all three programs feeding students into one another. Great. Thank you, Josh. And thank you, everyone. Now I'll hand over to Pamela uh, for the second two questions. Thanks, Kat. I'm just going to summarize a little bit before we move on, because although you've all been talking about some really different programs, some similarities have come out here. So what has been successful? So, so far, I've heard that you've all had really good uptake and traction from students. And perhaps later, we'll talk about how, how you managed to do that um, and great impact as well. And, and ultimately, it's all about the impact that we have on our students. Um, I also noticed collaboration that a few of you have talked about with different areas of the university. Um, training staff or training students is key. Uh, a couple of times discipline specificity came up. So the, the importance of teaching to the discipline that the students are going into. And that's one of the key differences, of course, between Elocos typically and, and post-entry. Um, and um, also the timing and delivery of the program seems to be quite critical as well from what you were just saying, Josh. So these are all the really uh, positive things that are working well. So having talked about the positive, um, the way that we can often learn is by reflecting on what hasn't gone so well and on the challenges. So I'm going to mix it up a little now and I'm going to ask Roz and Lucas to talk about 
the challenges that you experienced with your program? What challenges did you experience as you were perhaps implementing or delivering or evaluating any, any of those three stages? Uh, would you like me to go first or, or would you like Rosa, Rosa Lucas, yeah, to talk about the Monash program. Okay, I'm, I'm happy to go first. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges is to remember that you're dealing with peers who are students and not teachers. So things like time commitment, motivation, discipline and teamwork are very different for students than if you were working with um, staff, whether they be full time or part time. Um, and so you really need to approach these things from a different angle and actually bring into your program how you are going to create support for your student peers along this. Um, in addition to this, it's really important to teach the student peers how to set their own boundaries, particularly with others in the cohort, because they're not used to seeing themselves as different to other students in the cohort. And sometimes there can be some, some issues around boundaries or um, kind of feeling uncomfortable. And so I find it really good to have some practical activities where you help your peers get used to setting their own boundaries. Um, another challenge is that sometimes a lot of the, these programs and sometimes a lot of the best innovations can actually take quite a while to build. So you're building the culture and the experience and the direction of your program. Um, and sometimes these can be things that you're doing over um, a number of years. You, you can bring in some changes, but you are a lot of the time trying to change the, the culture sometimes in a, in a specific space. Um, I've worked in, in some areas before where, you know, we, we had to really build this um, desire for, for engagement and build the profile of our programs. And a lot of that was done through peer recommendation and that just takes time. So, um, and then finally, I think it's also interesting to consider whether you want to make your program voluntary or compulsory. And they each come with their own benefits and challenges. The benefits of working in a voluntary program is, of course, the students are going to be really motivated because they've chosen to come. But it does mean that you have to spend a lot of time with your marketing and promotion and think about how you're going to attract students. If you're working with compulsory, um, then you're, you are going to get a lot of students, but you might have to deal with different motivation factors or with explaining to students how this is going to really impact them in the future. And you're going to have to do that quite quickly um, in your program so that they um, remain engaged. So I think those are three of the most interesting challenges I, I've seen. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Roz, having, having worked in both the compulsory and the voluntary space, it is really challenging. And we talk a lot about the fact that um, often at the voluntary um, mechanisms, you get what we call the worried wells, the ones that sometimes don't need the, the support quite so much. And it's the ones that are in most need that it's really challenging to get to attend such things. So you're absolutely right. Lucas, did you have anything to add? I think uh, just one challenge uh, related to the specific uh, program that I was talking about, uh, which is how you upscale that kind of program, which is very discipline focused uh, because of the time commitment. So uh, I was teaching with the uh, academic uh, and how much time uh, you invest into those kinds of programs and how you could replicate that, for example, to all 10 different faculties at Monash if we wanted to, because uh, it goes a lot into that discipline specificity that helps the students, but at the same time, it's very labor, uh, labor intensive. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Scalability is absolutely critical, isn't it? And um, often if you, if you want to look at what, what could be replicated, but certain parts of it could be changed to be discipline specific and certain parts could be the same. So that is a challenge trying to find that balance. And Josh, any, any reflections from your experience on challenges? Major challenge, what Ross was saying as well, was um, student motivation and keeping them engaged in a voluntary program for us. Um, especially, like we understand the value this program brings. And like you're saying, like we see the value, but for students, it's sometimes a bit hard to tackle that. And they're balancing 100 other interest exams and assignments at the same time. 
Um, what kind of helped for us with that was um, starting offering snacks in the workshops, <laughs> like still a simple Tim Tam does a lot of magic. Um, and we also started introducing a rewards program where students who attended 80% or more of their um, sessions would get a participation certificate as well as a university memorabilia gift. And that kind of enhanced that feeling of connection and belonging even more to the university. Um, and I think it was mentioned as well, just really hammering in on the community building from workshop one and really bringing forward that sense of belonging and making sure students want to come back to the space week on week. Yeah, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And I seem to recall, Catherine, I don't think I'll ever forget the, the snow glow, wasn't it, that you were giving to everybody? <laughs> okay, um, we'll, move, we'll move to John now because um, um, the, one, the areas that John has looked after, some have been voluntary and some not voluntary. Um, so perhaps you've had different challenges, John. I'll, I'll hand over you to talk about uh, whatever challenges you've experienced. Interestingly, I mean, we, we have had some different challenges, but we've had a lot of the same challenges, I think. There's, um, like Roz and Josh and Lucas have mentioned, you know, I think one of the key differences between, say, teaching an Ellicost and then teaching an academic learning uh, post-entry program, um, the students' goals are, are different. Whereas in Ellicost, they are, their most immediate goal is to improve their language proficiency. Um, in the programs, the post-entry programs, often a secondary goal with their immediate goal being past the assessment. And so even in our, even in our coursework programs, you know, these uh, compulsory coursework programs, quite often the focus of the student is to pass that assessment, get through that assessment, as opposed to really reflect on um, the language skills that they need in order to pass that assessment. So a lot of what we do in our courses is, um, trying to get the students to focus on the language skills they need in order to be successful at university. I think that kind of leads into one of our other challenges. I spoke to a lot of the tutors on our programs um, and specifically about the differences between teaching in Ellicost and teaching in post-entry and they all mentioned time. Uh, whereas, you know, in, in Ellicost, you know, generally speaking, a student will be in an Ellicost course 20 hours a week, maybe 25 hours a week. Uh, for our undergraduate tutorial, uh, undergraduate program, it's two hours of lecture and two hours of tutorial, and that's it. Uh, and so that's not a lot of time to get through much of anything. Um, you have to be really, really focused on key learning outcomes and expectations. Um, and so a lot of the, a lot of the teachers who transitioned into post-entry teaching, um, they talked about how they need to reorient their approach, their methodology, even their teaching philosophy. Um, so, you know, a lot of us were trained in communicative teaching methods and two hours a week just doesn't really give you the time to take that kind of approach in a tutorial. And so there's been a shift in teaching philosophies, a lot more consciousness raising strategies, uh, cognitive approaches, teaching meta, you know, metacognitive strategies, teaching students how to learn and specifically how to learn language. Um, so there is a real, I think there is, um, I, I use the word transition. I think, that's an, I think that's a really useful word to describe that process of moving from Ellicott into post-entry. And it, I, it's, it's readily apparent to a lot of our tutors because they do work across both programs. Um, it can be a bit bewildering for them at times, I think, to have to shift strategies and approaches, sometimes even in the same day. Um, but it is, you know, that's one of the things in my conversations with them that was readily apparent about one of the big, biggest challenges they face. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, John, moving from 20 hours of English where there's a very clear uh, motivation for passing your direct entry program or whatever that happens to be is quite different from once you're in your degree program. And uh, as, you, as uh, I think a couple of you have said, it's difficult to motivate students when they think English is done. I've ticked that box, I've got in, why should I continue to study English? So the challenge is very much about messaging to students of the, the need, the ongoing need, actually, particularly for longer term employability. I think that's I think that's the only uh, stick or carrot we have there. I just wanted to ask any of the four of you to comment on any challenges with uh, working with the broader university, because none of you none of you have mentioned that. Have you had any challenges working with academics or getting getting any visibility for your program? Um, Ros, you did talk about it takes time to get traction with the students, but I'm wondering whether it takes time to get traction with the broader university and to be taken taken seriously, if you like. And any of you, if you'd like to comment on that. Um, yeah, uh, yes. Uh, 
certainly. <laughs> um, you know, the, I, I, we've, the content academics can be, um, there's challenges there, there's, and, but they differ. I've, I've, we've found that most of the academics, the content academics, they're engaged. They, they want to support their students, uh, but quite often they, they're not quite sure how or they're, they have unrealistic expectations of what their students should be capable of. You know, they think about, you know, oh, the student got a 6.5 on IELTS, therefore their English, you know, their academic English should be perfect. Um, and quite often it's interesting when you, when you work with these academics one-to-one, -one, you start to unpack what they expect from their students. You actually start to get a sense that what they expect of their native speaking Australian students is unrealistic as well. You know, they've worked in this area for years, sometimes decades, and, you know, the academic slang that they use on a daily basis is second nature to them, and they don't recognize the, the, the jargon or even the, you know, the, the dialect that they speak. Um, and they then don't understand how come the students don't reproduce that immediately in their courses. Um, so that's always, that's a, a perennial challenge um, in almost all the programs we work in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. Any comments from, from uh, Josh or Roz or, or Lucas about that? Uh, yeah, I think one of, the, one of the interesting things that I found working in the post-entry space is that you have to have a really clear message and you have to often have a different clear message depending on who you're talking to. So I have quite a different message when I talk to students. And it's also quite a different message depending on which campus I'm talking to students at. And one of the things that I've spent quite a lot of time doing is working out which messages work better for different faculties and different academics. Um, and then, but making that message really clear. So what is it exactly that this program does for them and their students? And I find that if I can answer that question for them, not everybody is, is always going to be immediately on board, but you're going to find enough people who go, okay, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go with that. Um, I think sometimes dealing with um, English language and, and also sometimes peer programs in the post-entry space, sometimes people can be a little, little bit confused as to what you ex actually do. And sometimes if they pick up the marketing material that, that you give to students, um, it may not be in the, the same kind of academic terms that they're used to. So uh, what, yeah, what I've been doing is, is simply tailoring my message using um, academic language, academic concepts, statistics, um, things like uh, scales, um, rankings, ratings, to really show the, the rigor behind what we do and the results and the reasoning. Yeah, I think you're absolutely spot on there, Roz. It's, it's definitely about speaking the academics language. And I've mentioned this at a couple of previous sessions we've had. They understand stats, they understand quant data, absolutely about telling them, what can I do for you? Um, and I gave an example at the last session of one that went particularly badly in my, uh, <laughs> in my situation, and I learned a lot from that, but definitely talking about what impact am I gonna have on your students? What impact am I not going to have on your delivery? Um, I think tailoring is absolutely critical, yeah. Um, Lucas or Josh, did you want to add anything else or shall we move to the next question? Just quickly wanted to add as well, um, it's getting the messaging right, but also the channel. I think in the beginning, we were very dependent on, we did one email out to so all new international students. So they have seen the message and they know about the program done. And that was definitely not the case. There's definitely a lot of different channels you can contact these students through. And it also vary from faculty to faculty in the way students interact and respond to these channels. So it's getting that messaging right via the right channels at the right time to the right people. It's really just all of these factors need to be in place to get the students engaged and in the program. And yeah, it does take a lot of time. Sure, absolutely. It's not just about front ending and thinking your work is done, right? Exactly. Okay, let's move on to the last question, um, which is around uh, learning. So you've all been involved for several years from the sounds of things um, in your particular university. Um, so what learnings could you share with other people who are interested in making that transition from Ellicost to post entry um, and, and tips for colleagues who, who, who want to make that transition? 
Um, Lucas, would you like to start off? Yes, definitely, Pamela. Uh, I think one of the th most important learnings, in my view, is um, the ability to compromise. <laughs> and I say that as, as any language teacher, as any language educator, we have these um, ideals of what is good language pedagogy, what has the most impact, what benefits most. Uh, but I think uh, working in the post-entry English language space, I found, I found myself at many times having to meet academics, meet the institution and the stakeholders at halfway through. I wasn't going to be able to do, uh, for example, the discipline specific pilot that we did last semester. I wasn't able to I wasn't able to go to do that when I first started three years ago. <laughs> so uh, you compromise and you find ways. Maybe it won't be the program that I think is the best program from a research point of view, from a pedagogy, language pedagogy point of view, but is the best program that I can deliver with the stakeholders that are involved in this point in time. So being very conscious of that and trying to work from that practical point of view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point, actually, being pragmatic about what's achievable, right? Um, Ros, Josh, would you like to add anything? Ros, Ros? What uh, learning? Yeah, so I think um, one of the biggest learnings that I've found is that it's really important to tailor your model. So you can take good practice from lots of, lots of other places, but then it's really important to think about your students your peer facilitators, your university, and think about the nuances of, you know, the, the campus, the faculties, who these students are, why they are coming to you, and what you're going to do for them. Um, one of the most interesting things that I found with the Let's Chat program, which um, other universities have used some of the principles for, is also how different some of the offerings are, because they have been tailored to that um, context. So I think one of the, the things that people really need to be aware of is that you really need to know your cohort very well um, on, a, on a really deep level in order to give them the best program and in order to create the best results for you. Um, and then the second thing that I would say um, is that I've learned that you should never ever stop innovating. So I think one of the things that I find um, exhilarating about peer programs and, and working in the post-entry space is that you are never ever standing still. There is always something new, always something different. You've always, you're always trying a new way of, do, of doing things or you've always got a new idea. Um, I often go to my facilitators, I often go to my students um, and I ask them lots of questions. And so I'm always changing something. Um, and I think sometimes, particularly in a, in a period like, like, like now, um, it can be difficult sometimes to, to keep that creativity and that spirit of innovation. But I think it's really important in the post-entry space that you never, ever stand still because your students aren't. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, Kat, earlier you were talking about a sharing between institutions. And I know a lot of people have listened to work that's been going on in other institutions around the country and that's been really successful. But you're right, Roz, it's not necessarily a lift and shift that's going to work exactly the same way in another institution. So it's got to be tailored. Josh, did you want to add anything? Yes, echoing a few of the things that Ross was saying. So first of all, really to consider your institutional context and just really avoiding a support offering like this operating in silo on its own. So reaching out to key staff across units, programs, um, faculties in your organization, and really look at how you can hook these into your program. Uh, also being aware of what kind of support is being offered and how your program is unique in that. And then with that, directing the students in your cohort to these support offerings. It's going to either be done in like a general way, just making students aware, or also in a really um, specific way, just really targeted activities, say this week, this is happening, go and attend, here's where you find it. Because um, I think we often forget that the English language is not just part of um, the classes and assignments, but it can also really prevent students from feeling comfortable in accessing these events and services around the university. 
just make sure they know they're welcome and capable of accessing these um, services really helps them in their student experience. Um, and then the second thing is well, feedback. We constantly listen to feedback of our students. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a project where we take feedback this serious and not two iterations of Speaking Connect have been the same. Um, so we don't just look out for X percent of students would recommend a program to a friend, really looking at what did you enjoy in the workshop? What did you not enjoy? And then at the end of each iteration, look at this and make small changes to the program and already have quite a few changes planned for next year. Okay, and, Yeah. Um, so John, um, last but not least, um, learnings, I mean, you've been involved for, for many years now in, in a number of different types of programs. What, what general learnings would you like to share with people who, who would like to make that transition from Elacos? Um, well, I like, first I'd like to second everything everybody said previously, because I, I think those are all fantastic ideas. Um, but if you're looking to make the transition from Elacosa, uh, if there aren't opportunities, immediate opportunities to teach on a post-entry program, uh, you know, make sure that you're teaching in any of the direct entry programs your uh, institute might be delivering, or at least the higher level EAP programs. Um, I also strongly recommend brushing up on the, on the relevant literature. Um, Leah and Street's seminal work in academic literacies, that's kind of what in a way kicked off this entire uh, um, approach in education. In Australia, there is the AALL Journal, the Australian Academic Language and Learning Journal. Um, sorry to be plugging somebody else's journal. The EA Journal is also very good, but um, the AALL Journal is very accessible and practice oriented. Most of the articles are practitioners in the space. Um, several of them have actually been um, cited in the EA CPFD. So I get to plug that now. Um, another writer who I think, uh, somebody else in the literature who I think is always worth reading is Ursula Wingate. Um, she's just a phenomenal writer. She's, you know, uh, you don't get to say very often about academics. That's a fun read, but she often is. Um, and she's passionate about this space and has written on it for many years. So, uh, and I think, I think, you know, teaching as much as you can in the space and finding out what's actually going on in the literature. That will help you not only understand the space better, but get you more attuned to the language that's used in, in the academic space of post-entry. Yeah, I, I completely agree, John, having made the transition myself, um, definitely leading, uh, reading the, the literature. And I think it's really important to get your head out of Elocos. When you're doing post-entry, it's not Elocos. You have to understand academic literacies and it isn't quite the same thing. So I think you're absolutely right. Go and have a look at those journals, look at those writers um, so that you, you broaden your understanding of what, of what language is in these contexts. Um, all right, so we've come to the end of the questions. I'm gonna hand back uh, uh, the, the four questions. So I'm gonna hand over to Kat to open up to questions from the, uh, from the attendees. Great, thanks Pamela. Um, so do we have any questions that you'd like to ask the panelists? Um, you can unmute yourself and jump in with your question or you can put it in the chat if you're feeling a little shy. <laughs> maybe, maybe we're writing, maybe, maybe. Um, I have a question. Oh, fantastic, Leslie. Thank you. That's okay. Um, it sounds amazing. I think the whole concept is fantastic. And uh, I'm just wondering, is it always, is it ever compul a compulsory part of a course or it's, it's always optional? Uh, I would say overall it varies depending on, there's, there's a vast range of models that you can use. Um, John, did you want to answer that from your perspective? Um, so I was actually posting the link to the Leon Street article in the chat and realized I hadn't done it correctly. Could you repeat the question just so uh, I... Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, John. Um, I'm just saying, I'm just asking, I, I may have missed this in, I was t busily taking notes and things. So um, I was just wondering, are these uh, courses always optional for the students or are they sometimes developed as part of the course so they're more or less compulsory? Uh, I think that will depend on the institute. I know a lot of um, a lot of programs have tried different 
approaches to making their program to making their courses compulsory and have not got very far with it. Uh, we were very lucky at Griffith in that we had champions. So we had very high level champions. We had a, a DVCA, so the um, Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic and mm -hmm. Vice Chancellor International who were very supportive of the program. Uh, and then they had to do a lot of work in wrangling the different schools and groups into integrating courses into their program. Sure. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's heavy duty coordination that is got to be more often than not, has got to be a top down approach. Um, for our voluntary programs, which where we don't have a compulsory component, uh, it's about making them as enticing as possible yeah. and also integrating them as much as possible where we can. So where we've got a lot of buy in from students, you know, it's, it's almost like product placement. Oh, by the way, if you notice this as well, um, to give you an example, we have uh, a, a very robust um, online offering um, that we call English Help Help Yourself Resources. And we've actually integrated those into our feedback mechanisms in our ELICs, so our compulsory undergraduate courses. So when students submit an essay or an assignment, our feedback model actually integrates links to our online materials as well. And then there's also links to our workshops. So it's, you know, to um, scaffold in a lot of these other activities into our form. Yeah. Try to close that feedback loop, so to speak. Yeah, it's great. Thanks, John. You actually raise a really good point as well, and it sort of come up in across the different panellists' answers too, about the cross-referral from different offerings. So you're trying to cross-refer students from perhaps compulsory offerings to voluntary, from voluntary to voluntary, you know, and you're trying to sort of... Um, make it evident to students the kind of network of support activities that they have available to them within the university and the the varying purposes of all of these support offerings and they may be appropriate for some students at some time and then you know it sort of shifts depending on where the students at in their their overall journey at the university too yeah, yeah. um are there any more questions We've got time for another question from participants. Um, hi. I hi, guess, Amy. Hi, how are you going? Listen, we've just started in the post-entry space. I'm sorry, I missed the very first part, so if this has been addressed, um, please excuse me. But uh, we, I guess something that is a challenge if it's not compulsory is attendance, of course. And I guess we're going back to the stakeholders and saying, we've got really good feedback from the students that attended and we you know we put all these things in place to get feedback from them but when we're showing attendance the attendance isn't that strong so um i guess how to couch that with the stakeholders to say listen actually the students that came got a lot out of it but when they're looking at the attendance numbers you know it may not be that um convincing <laughs> yes. yeah I mean that that's a really really good point and and you know you can really you can provide all the beautiful qualitative feedback um, from students about the benefit etc but a key point sorry the dog next door's barking <laughs> a key point that um, you know the the key stakeholders always look for are reach and scalability and the fact that you've actually you know had a high number of people attending um however i think maybe ross ros you had some good um insights before about demonstrating impact to stakeholders that may have gone sort of beyond the attendance numbers about wham and progression and that sort of thing yeah look i, I mean i think you can definitely look at um, other statistics as well as um, participation, things like were, were these students more likely to complete more of their course? Where did they have higher marks? Um, we also have a lot of evaluation to do with confidence. So we ask student, students questions like, um, at the beginning of the course, how well are you understanding lectures and tutorials? And then we ask them that same question at the end and often confidence has grown significantly and that's a, and that's a statistic but yeah. that's something that we can get from the students and so we could say something like I'm just going to pull some numbers out of my head 
25% of students said that they, um, you know, did not feel confident with understanding any lectures or tutorials. And by the end of this course, it was only 2%, I don't know, something like that. But I think another opportunity that you have when you are working, especially if it's a new program, is if you can go back to these stakeholders and show the work that you're doing for them and ask them if they would come along with you on the journey to help promote the programs more. So yeah. kind of say, look, you know, we have these programs, we're getting these really great results. We'd really love to help more of your students. Do you have suggestions or are there ways that we can partner with you to reach more of your students? Can we have a kind of referral service? Is there something else that, that we could do for you so that we can help more of your students? And often I find that the different faculties will have their own promotion strategies or their own teams who might be able to help you get um, your message out. And I tend to find that if the recommendation comes from the faculty, students listen to it a lot more. Yeah. Um, and because you are providing for them a service, they will, they will often um, think of ways that they can give you more students. Yeah, thanks for that. That's really good advice. And I think we realised that between semester one and semester two, we needed more buy-in from our um, academics. Uh, I guess one thing we noticed, this is more a comment than a question, is we had a lot of academics, especially this year, that were really happy for the support and really excited that there was something being put in place, but didn't have the time to get involved, to participate as much, which I guess is just part of the part of the space. But yeah, thanks. Sorry, for can I can I ask, is it online or face to face? Uh... It's a bit of both. So we're doing some work online and some face to face. No hybrid model at the moment. I mean, you know, we've got either online or face to face. So um, the idea is like being able to really connect with the students face to face. I think that's been really um, useful. But I think also the online having a bit more connection uh, with us, you know, us here being in Australia has been useful for the students as well. But it's a uh, yeah, it's been a tricky year. Mm. Yeah. Indeed. I'd like to just make a quick suggestion, Amy, um, as, as you uh, deliver more and more, if you compare the results of the students who did attend to those who did not, and you make a PowerPoint, really simple PowerPoint, you send it to the academics, this is what happens for the ones who did attend, this is the one what happens to the ones mm -hmm. who did not attend. And, and usually you can see, I mean, correlation is not necessarily causation, but it works yeah. pretty much the same. Yeah. So um, that's a nice little tip that you can, um, to get students and academics on board. Great, thanks, Pamela. Thanks so much. Mm. So on that note, I can see it's 5.02 and we probably all want to go off and do whatever we do after five o'clock. Um, but I'd like to thank our panellists particularly. So can we have a virtual round of applause for our panellists? Thank you so much. It's been fantastic to hear your insights, to hear the diversity in the programs that you offer um, and also to see the common themes that arise across all of the programs. It's also great to hear how sort of um, determination and dedication over long periods of time and constant innovation is also a theme. And we're all working together to try and, I guess, keep getting better at what we do and learn more and more and keep innovating. And it's great to have this chance to kind of share those ideas across multiple institutions, um, particularly in this space, i.e. the EA SIG space and also the post-entry space, of course. Um, so on that note, I'd also like to thank English Australia for hosting and also thank Pamela and Marta, um, the, my co-convenors, co I think, of this. Um, and so thank you, everyone. Thank you to um, the participants. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for coming. And we thank will you. see Bye. you soon. Have a good thank night. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kate and later. Pamela. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sophie. Yeah, thanks, Sophie. We got a lot of um, resources too. Yeah, so I'm going to um, save this chat and I'll add them to the to the last slide. Um, and then when we share the slides. Um, uh, yeah, and I'll just cool. e email our presenters as well about um, 
the recording. Yeah, but we can oh, turn okay. that around. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, Sophie. Thanks, All right. Pamela. Thanks, Pamela. Bye. Take care, Pamela, and thanks, Kat. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.